This is Mr. Dolan here from Troop 403. We're here to talk about the Skating Merit Badge. The Skating Merit Badge has two parts to it. We have a little bit of classroom material to cover, and we'll do a little bit of skating at our local ice rink to complete the Merit Badge. So let's get started. First, let's have a little bit of a background on ice skating or skating in general. Skating has been around for a very long time, depending upon which website you go to. It's been uh, known for hundreds or even thousands of years. Here's an example of a very old skate found from the medieval period. And what you're looking at there is not what we would normally see on the bottom of a skate, like a, a steel blade or a set of wheels, but it's actually an animal bone um, with a couple of leather straps that have been threaded through it. Skating has always been around and invented for the purpose of going a little further than you normally could on foot while using less energy. So here's an example where we have a runner side by side with a skater. The runner has taken several steps to get to his current distance. And as you can see, the skater has only taken one or two steps and he has doubled the runner's current distance. A lot of people like skating due to the thrill and ex excitement that it provides. Hockey players are known to be able to skate almost 30 miles per hour, and speed skaters are known to skate over 50 miles per hour. And skating is found, you know, in many, many places, uh, recreation, sports, and entertainment. So you might have gone to a public skate, or you might know somebody who plays a game on ice, or perhaps you've seen some type of entertainment such as the ice capades or Disney on ice or the Olympics figure skating or ice dancing. There are lots of different types of skates as we mentioned previously. Here's just a few. Uh, we have roller skates which is a, a boot that is affixed to a platform that has four wheels uh, not unlike a, a car uh, with a large rubber stopper in the front of the uh, boot uh, to help you control speed and stopping. Ice skates, on the other hand, instead of having wheels underneath the skate, we have a steel blade underneath the foot, and this is meant to travel on frozen surfaces. And then we have inline skates, which are sort of a hybrid of ice skates and roller skates, where we take the wheels of the roller skate and put them one after another underneath the foot to simulate an ice skate. Let's talk a little bit more about ice skates. There are many different types of ice skates. Here shown in the picture, we have three different types. The first one on the left is figure skates. And each one of these, we're gonna take a look at the blade specifically, which is the main differentiator on these skates. On the figure skate, you can see that the blade is long. It extends beyond the heel of the foot. And at the front of the foot, we have something, uh, a jagged edge there, which is called a toe pick. And that helps an ice skater or an ice dancer to perform uh, quick stops and um, athletic moves, spins, and that sort of thing uh, on the ice. Moving on, we have the hockey skate. Now again, look at the bottom of the skate. You'll see that the blade is shorter and it's curved. And the shorter blade allows for very, very quick turns and maneuverability in a fast-paced game like hockey. And then let's look at the speed skate. The blade on the bottom of the speed skate is longer and the purpose of that is to allow the speed skater more contact with the ice so that he can push off, he or she can push off and get um, going much, much faster in a straight line. A speed skater is not typically going to be known for their ability to maneuver quickly or turn quickly. They're more into straight line speed skating. Let's take a closer look at the ice skate. So far, we've already seen that most of them do have in common these items. Every skate has some type of blade that allows it to travel on a frozen surface. If equipped, some skate blades have a toe pick and all skates have a boot where you would insert your foot into to put the skate on. Let's take a little closer look at the blade and let's talk about the sharpness of the blade. So at the bottom of the blade, if you were to examine the piece of steel there, you would see at the bottom where the blade makes contact with the ice surface that there are actually a uh, there's actually a small curve built into the blade which is what we call a hollow 
Now hollows come in many different shapes. Uh, they're typically measured in inches or uh, millimeters, depending upon where you're from. Uh, in this case, the middle one here uh, is what we call a half inch hollow, and that's a very common depth for getting new skates sharpened. So as you can see, the hollow actually creates two edges on each skate. And so since you have two skates on, you'll have a left skate and a right skate, there are actually four edges in total that an ice skater would need to be aware, aware of when they're learning how to ice skate. In this diagram, we see that the left skate has a left inside edge and a left outside edge, and the right skate has a right inside edge and a right outside edge. Knowing that you have four different edges will help you to learn how to, do, how to skate much better. Where do people skate? Well, probably the most common place nowadays that we see people skating is at an indoor or an outdoor ice rink. Here's an example of one here where a public skate is going on and several people are on the ice having fun. But it's not limited to indoor. Most uh, skating originated in an outdoor setting. And so on frozen ponds and frozen lakes and frozen rivers, you can also find people doing outdoor skating in a recreational way. Some places actually have frozen trails that would allow a person or a group of people to skate on. Uh, we do have one of these locally here down in South Park. It's a, a very small oval and it's only open in the wintertime. Uh, and there are bigger, longer trails in different locations in the country. In addition to these places, there are some uh, more exotic type places to skate. What we're looking at here is a um, picture of a sport called ice cross, which is like a, uh, you can think of it as a, a downhill skating race. Uh, doesn't look very safe. <laughs> so when we go skating, there's a few things that we need to be aware of. And let's talk about some of the possible hazards that you might come across. Probably the biggest hazard on the ice is other people, especially if the ice is crowded. Remember, we talked about that the thrill of skating often involves high speeds and going fast. And it's very likely that if one isn't careful, that one could run into another object or another person. Uh, collisions are very common and probably the biggest cause of injury on, uh, on skates. So collisions is definitely something we have to be aware of. Uh, there are other things that can also get in our way. If, for example, we're in an outdoor setting, there could be uh, tree branches or snow or debris on the ice. Uh, or again, uh, maybe a, a small person might be in your way while you're skating and you might accidentally run into them. So we, you could even consider a person as an object or an obstacle. Bad surfaces is another situation that we need to be aware of. Sometimes the ice can have some cracks in it or it can have uh, some wear and tear that might cause the surface to be not smooth and going over a not smooth surface uh, can be very dangerous. And uh, even if we move away from ice skating to let's say roller skating or rollerblading today, uh, you can imagine skating down a sidewalk where the sidewalk has separated and uh, you, you might very easily stumble over the crack in a sidewalk if the sidewalk isn't even. So we have to be aware of bad surfaces when we're skating. And we also have to be aware of thin surfaces, especially in situations where we are in an outdoor natural setting, skating on ice outside. We wanna make sure that the ice is thick enough to support our weight. And so we don't wanna skate on thin ice because what will happen? Yes, we'll, the ice will crack and we will fall straight through it into whatever water uh, lies below. Another condition that we need to be aware of is extreme temperatures. This means if we're outside doing ice skating, we need to be aware of extreme cold. We don't want to be in the extreme cold too long. Or if we're outside in the summer and it's very hot outside, we need to be aware of uh, heat exhaustion as well. So whenever we're about to go skating, we want to try to anticipate, help prevent, mitigate, and respond to these hazards as much as possible to make our area for skating a safe place. So what happens if we do have an injury or an illness that takes place during our skating? 
well as scouts, we want to be prepared for these types of um, these types of injuries and illnesses. So this is not the first aid merit badge, but we will uh, send out a link to some very brief videos to talk about some of the common first aid tactics that could be used to help mitigate situations, injuries or illnesses that might occur from skating. And let's take a look at some of the more common ones. As we mentioned, hypothermia and frostbite could both occur in a cold environment, lacerations and abrasions, uh, the typical cuts and bruises that one might get when either having a collision or um, you know, maybe uh, accidentally making contact with a sharp ice skate. Uh, these are things we would need to be aware of. Other things that could happen, sprains, uh, bone breaks, uh, blisters is another common one. We see blisters frequently when we wear our skates too long and we might be, uh, you know, our, part of our foot might be rubbing up inside the boot of the skate. And so blisters are another thing that can develop quickly in skating. Uh, we mentioned uh, heat related reactions and shock is another one as well. We'll again send some small brief videos out to uh, identify these conditions and how to care for them. What kinds of things can we do on the ice to improve safety and courtesy while we're out there skating? Well, as we mentioned, collisions are probably the biggest thing to worry about. So we want to try to keep a safe distance apart from other skaters. OK. You know, we don't want to interfere with other other folks that are out there. You might be in a skating situation and somebody might be trying to work on something, it's probably best to give them their distance so that they can safely work on what they're working on and so that you can enjoy your time too. Another problem that we sometimes see in skating environments is aggressive skating or game playing. You know, tag is a common problem. When we have a public skate and we see a couple of kids out there, they're trying to chase each other and play tag. And um, tag doesn't mix well with people who have, don't have a lot of skating experience. Uh, you can easily cause an accident by playing games on the ice. And again, if we're in an outdoor situation, we want to take some steps to prepare the skating area. You know, we want to take a look at the ice surface. We want to remove any snow. We want to look at the surface of the, of the ice. Is it smooth enough to skate on? Is there any debris on the ice that could cause an accident? You know, if there's a area that's marked out of bounds for skating, we don't want to go past that. And we also want to make sure that the ice is at least four inches thick before we go skating on it if we're going in a natural setting. Anything less than that, and there's a high risk of falling through the ice. If you do have a situation where someone has cracked uh, through the ice in a, in a lake or in a pond, the best thing to do is to not approach them right away. You know, there's there's things that we can extend to that person to try to help pull them out of the situation. Uh, as we see in the diagram below, we have uh, an individual who's extending a branch to the person who has fallen through. Probably the best thing that you could have is a ring buoy and a, and a rope, like you might have in a swimming pool. You know, keep that available. You know, that's part of our preparation to making making sure that the area is a good place to, to to skate. Other things you can extend onto the ice would be maybe a ladder or a small boat if you happen to have it. If you don't have these things, we can start looking at tree branches or extending a hockey stick, or we might want to try to make a human chain as a last case resort, which also puts us at risk, but will still uh, offer an opportunity to try to pull the person to safety. How do we? take care of our skates. Let's say you might want to go out and pick up some skates of your own and you want to uh, make that investment. Let's, what are the best ways to try to care for them? Let's just talk about the blades for a minute. The blades are the uh, most, um, I'd say the item on the skates that are the most susceptible to damage. So whenever you get a pair of skates, it's very good practice to also get a pair of blade covers or what, what they call skate guards to go along with those skates. And the reason for that is is twofold. You know, number one, those edges on the blades can be sharp. And so if we have a protective material covering the sharp edges, that's going to protect your hands or other parts of your body uh, from getting cut from those blades. And secondly, we want to protect that steel, right? We, uh, we, we get the skates sharpened and we want to keep them sharp so that we don't have to resharpen them every time we use them. And so in order to keep them sharp, we can put a protective covering on the skate to keep them safe from gouging or uh, nicking against other sharp objects or even dull objects like uh, stone or rock or wood or concrete. So 
here's a couple examples of common skate guards. So if we see here a plastic skate guard that's uh, that the blade has been inserted to in this case. In this case, we have a skate guard made of elastic and terry cloth or towel. Uh, that's sort of doubly useful because you could use the towel to help keep the blade dry after you're done using it. And here's a third example, sort of a hybrid of the uh, plastic skate guard, but it has some additional wheels mounted on it. And this allows the person to continue to use the skate in maybe an indoor setting um, while still protecting the blade. So what happens when we're done skating for the day? How do we take care of our skates? Well, as we mentioned, one thing we want to do is we want to take a towel and dry those blades off because rust will uh, impact your steel blades. We don't want their blades to rust over because when that happens, we'll probably have to get them resharpened again. Another thing we can do to protect our skates is to loosen the boot laces. We want to try to get as much ventilation as possible as we can into the skates to help them dry out quickly on the inside. A great place to keep your skates if you can, uh, if you have one, is an equipment bag. So we can put our skates into an equipment bag and that'll help protect them and protect the blades. And another quick tip here is that we want to try to keep the skate blades, or keep the skates apart so that the blades don't contact each other. If they bump into each other, they can easily nick or gouge each other and then we have to get our skate sharpened again. And finally, we'll keep these in a cool, dry place so uh, we can grab them quickly for the next use. So now that we've got you uh, interested in ice skating, maybe someday you might want to try to do some ice skating or roller skating competitively. Um, let's talk briefly about competition with skating, with regard to skating. There are some things that we need to be aware of whenever we set up competition with skating. And I'd like to just point out a few of those now. So first, you know, let, let's say we're setting up a, an ice skating race. You know, what do we need to do to, um, to get our race set up? Well, number one, we have to have some ground rules, right? We have to sort of measure out a course and decide, you know, where the start is and where the finish is. And maybe number two, and we want to make sure everybody has the right safety equipment. Helmets are very important in skating. They'll help to save you from a fall or a crash. Uh, maybe we might want to have other equipment too, maybe elbow pads or knee pads, something like that. So let's agree that everybody has the right safety equipment. Next, let's agree what's the right number of competitors in our race. Do we want to have a skate race where we have 100 people racing at the same time? Probably not. I think that wouldn't be a very safe thing because a lot of people going fast in a small area is very likely to create some some havoc or some collisions. So another thing we can do to prepare for a race is to anticipate injuries. So for example, we might want to have on hand some first aid materials that we might need to treat some of the common problems that you might have in a skating situation. So we know things like uh, maybe cuts and bruises. We might want to have uh, suture or band-aid material around to handle that, that type of injury. Or we might want to have an ice pack around in case somebody does get a bruise from a skate. Another common thing to see at skating competitions is to have an emergency medical technician on hand. And sometimes we refer to that person as the athletic trainer, right? When we see a, like a hockey game and there's an injury on the ice, uh, immediately we have the medical professional goes out onto the ice and tries to I diagnose what the uh, injury might be and try to help the person. So having an EMT on hand is a great idea. And um, just to get, give you an example, whenever there is a hockey game at our local rink, there's almost always an EMT on hand to deal with any type of injury that might occur during the game. Well, thanks for listening. I hope you found this information informative and enjoyable. And our next step is to meet at the local ice rink so that we can continue the merit badge and complete it there. Thanks for watching and let me know if you have any questions.